Okay, uh, so again, welcome everyone to another installment of our uh, journey through Dostoevsky's Demons. I hope you're enjoying the reading. I hope uh, you are finding lots and lots of things to think about and talk about. Uh, so I just want to, again, briefly go, go through some of the things that, that we, we covered in this last part of the reading. And then um, I'll let uh, CJ and Doug um, maybe say a few words after that. So we have quite a few new characters that we, we've been introduced to in a, a little more depth. And so what I want to do is uh, I updated my diagram with that we had drawn before. So I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully you can see this. Um, can you see my screen? Not if you can. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, we mostly seen already the main characters from part one. They were all introduced in part one. But now we've really been introduced to two, two more characters that we haven't really seen before. And these are the, um, the governor and the governess, uh, uh, Andrei Antonovich von Lemke, Julia Mikhailovna von Lemke. Uh, these are also important characters. They're somewhat parallel, I would say, to uh, Varvara Petrovna and uh, Stepan Trofimovich both in their um, age group and in their role as, as these sort of presiding figures to uh, which interact with some of the younger characters in the novel. Uh, and then of course we have, we've been introduced to this uh, nascent conspiracy uh, group, uh, which is represented right here. Uh, some of the, these are the core members, uh, of course, uh, uh, aggregated by Pyotr Stepanovich Verkhavensky. So the, this is Lamshin. Uh, again, I'm using, I'm using uh, the cast of characters from, uh, from uh, the film that was made by a uh, Russian uh, 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 production company, which I think they did a really good job. And so I'm trying to put, put a face to the name. Hopefully this will help you a little bit uh, to navigate, navigate the novel and maybe visualize a possible uh, how a possible character could have looked like. They've done a really good job with with uh, both um, the cast and the uh, like the uh, the clothing of the time, so it matches the historical appearances of people as they wore different things. So anyway, uh, and then we have of course uh, the convict Fetka, uh, this uh, criminal element in the novel, a kind of a sinister element that uh, who is adding a little bit more of mystery and suspense to the plot as it develops. And uh, we, for the first time, we have a scene with Mavriki Nikolaevich, who is, of course, um, engaged to Elizaveta Nikolaevna Tushina. Uh, both of these characters really have not played uh, a crucial role up to this point, but they, they will become more prominent in some ways, especially Elizaveta Nikolaevna. But uh, Mavriki Nikolaevich, is of course, um, uh, we, we read about him confronting Stavrogin and in fact, asking him to, to take Elizabeth Nikolaevna to be his wife. Of course, he is not privy to the fact that Nikolai St uh, Selvich Stavrogin is actually married to Maria Timofeevna. So all of this intrigue and uh, triangles are happening in the meantime, as there are some sinister things happening in the uh, in this town. And what are those? We have, we have uh, a series of really um, dastardly uh, events taking place. All of them, uh, I would say uh, events of the same order, which, which is meant to destabilize the norms, uh, challenge the norms in some way. Um, so what are some of those things? Uh, well, there's this scandalous appearance of pornography in a, a bag of a person who's distributing the Bibles. And of course, uh, you know, the contrast there is what, what, what's being underlined. Then we have the destruction of an icon by placing a, a mouse. Uh, so these icons typically have like a glass covering and, and uh, to protect it from the weather. 
and somebody broke the glass and put a, put a mouse in it uh, next to it. So that it desecrated essentially that, that uh, icon, which uh, would have been uh, a terrible event. Uh, a lot of these icons were expensive. They were commissioned to be painted by some famous uh, artists. So they were not easy to come by. And they, they typically were regarded as these sacrosanct um, uh, items of, of, of each um, region. And then we have uh, some other interesting developments such as uh, this, um, uh, these get togethers where the conspirators are talking about what they wanna do. And uh, at one point they play this uh, very rousing French uh, revolutionary song, Marseillaise, and then uh, it sort of degenerates into uh, Mein Lieber Augustine, which is a completely uh, different uh, genre and, and style of song, a song about uh, personal uh, affection and there's nothing to do with revolution or, or ideal uh, idealism or anything like that. So all of this is very interesting. I'm, I'm curious uh, about what you guys thought about this this trend of these events and, and what importance they play in, in the novel. Um, we have this notion of uh, the governor and the governess both knowing about these things and yet not taking any action. And this idea that they're trying to control it in some way and perhaps save the youth from youthful optimism at the same time, uh, allowing them to express themselves. Very reminiscent, I think, of a lot of things that are happening uh, today with older generation and, and new generation and sort of the dynamics there are very interesting. And Dostoevsky, I think, was genius in how he portrayed the various attitudes of uh, people that have traditionally been in power and how they act and react to these younger progressive elements, these revolutionaries. There's a lot of very interesting dynamics there, including the attitude of a renowned author Karamzin, who is, who of course, a, a, um, a, a portrait of a real uh, author, Turgenev. And Dostoevsky is very critical of him, very satirical of him, um, uh, portrays him as this uh, holier than thou um, uh, writer with a big W, uh, but uh, the one who is at the same time try, uh, very much um, um, slavish when it comes to these younger younger um, revolutionaries and tries to be on, 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 on a good footing with them. So anyway, a, a lot has happened. Um, I, um, I'm gonna pause here and, and let um, CG or Doug, whoever wants to go first, uh, say a few words as well, and then we can, we can open it up to everybody. Uh, so I, I would just uh, highlight some of the things that occurred to me. Uh, in the previous reading at the end of chapter three in part two, um, Nikolai Stavrogin tells Dasha, quote, I won't uh, destroy either of the insane women. Uh, we discussed the trope of insane women last month. It's a little troubling, but I won't go into it. Um, but in chapters four through seven, our reading for this week, I was trying to identify candidates for the second insane woman. The first one is, of course, Maria Lebyatkin, uh, Nikolai Stavrogin's wife, uh, who nobody knows that they're married yet, except us, of course. <laughs> um, I thought maybe, you know, it's not likely, but Julie von Lemke uh, could be um, in some sense, the, the narrator seems to portray Julie von Lemke as not quite all together. So that's a candidate. Arena Virginsky, we meet at the end, she uh, might qualify, but I thought most likely it was Liza Titian. Uh, I can't read how you have her name. Uh, my uh, translation. Well, it's Elizabeth, uh, basically. So yeah, it's Elizabeth. Uh, and um, so I thought that was an interesting thread. I, I, 
Dostoevsky does a lot in this novel where there are little hints, puzzles. And so sometimes I trace them and that was one of the puzzles I was trying to trace. Uh, another uh, puzzle is the chapter, the first chapter four is um, general anticipation. And so I tried to guess what Dostoevsky wanted us to, uh, what was the general anticipation? And it's right after the duel, Stavrogan, in the beginning of chapter four, Stavrogan is highlighted as everyone's, his esteem is rising. Well, that's a general anticipation of Stav, Nikolai Stavrogan's rising esteem after the duel. Maybe the chapter is trying to highlight that. But then um, there's an, also an anticipation um, because Shatov punched Nikolai Stavrogan. We might generally anticipate how that relationship, we've already seen some of that last time, uh, two weeks ago. Um, Julie von Lemke, uh, writes um, about anticipating the young. And, and I thought that was it. And I wrote down in my book, this is the general anticipation. And then like two or three paragraphs later, uh, it, it turns to the day-long entertainment she's going to organize. And when you trace the whole of chapter four, I have to admit, that um, Julie von Lemke's gala affair is probably what the general anticipation is about. But, uh, you know, as I go through and I try to figure this novel out, you, you know, you don't know that until you're done and then you reread and reflect on what you've read. And the antics and shenanigans um, involving um, uh, Lai, Lai Yim Shin, uh, the clown, who's also one of the five, right? The five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have Layamishin, if I'm butchering that, I apologize. And who are the others? Um, Virginsky and. Um, I think it's. Uh, uh, there's one more. Uh, Le Leputin. Uh, so and Shigalov. Shig uh, yeah, Shigalov, yes. yes Tokol Tokolchenko, who we haven't met yet. Yes, Le but they, they really play a very, very uh, small role. Um, so we don't really know a whole lot about them up to this point anyway. Um, we, but Yamshin and Liputin, uh, of course, we have met in the very beginning. And so they keep coming back to, to right. the forefront in different contexts. And, and Shigalov, we meet this time. Shigalov is part of this hilarious meeting of the secret society, which I thought Peter and Nikolai were going to lead. There's all this anticipation. They walk into the meeting. They're going to lead this meeting. Some great things are going to happen. And oh my God, that was the funniest part of the novel. Well, what you mentioned, uh, Phil, about the music, that is the most intricate musical comedy in a novel I've ever read. That, that passage with the, um, uh, where are my notes? Uh, the Marseillai and the um, uh, Ode to Augustine. Liber Augustine. What, what, what comedy there? This, this novel is a comedy, I mean, so far. And um, the, the antics, Laya Shin, who is one of the five, we don't find that out until later, he does all these shenanigans, including that passage you mentioned, he might be the one who left the dead mouse, maybe not, I mean, there's speculation. But, um, you know, he's also involved in, you know, that whole scene involved a uh, wife beating and, and other ethically challenging behavior, including the witnessing of a suicide. I mean, post-suicide, but, you know, before the police arrived to deal with the scene. 
it's incredible. Um, so those are my highlights uh, from. Yeah, I, I wanted oh, to mention that too. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, CJ. The, the, the scene with the suicide of this young boy um, is also, the way it is described, it's also, to me anyways, uh, part of that same order of events, which essentially desacralize what we consider somewhat serious and sacred. So they, you know, they, these women and men, they come there, it's almost like they're out on a trip. And so what they decide to do for amusement is to come to this hotel to see this boy who just killed himself. And the reason he killed himself is because he, he lost all this money that was entrusted to him. And he's what, nine or eight years old or some very, like very young. And, and, and they, they completely, um, they profane it really, that's what they're doing. They, they do not take it, um, it's almost like crashing a funeral type of scenario, which by the way uh, is, uh, if you've ever watched uh, what's that, Wedding Crashers, um, is not a completely outlandish uh, idea in American culture where, um, and maybe we can talk about this because uh, there are a lot of comedians that, uh, whom I generally very much enjoy, like George Carlin or somebody else, um, who essentially say there is nothing sacred and we can laugh at everything and anything. And um, that's a, that's a up for debate, I think. Um, and Dostoevsky, of course, he makes, he pushes this idea by, by making it real. How do you, you know, how do you actually, like, are there things that are beyond? Um, All of these shenanigans were borderline, you, you want to take these people and punish them for their, um, uh, uh, insolence. And we haven't mentioned yet the local saintly soul and prophet Semyon Yakov Bolovich. Yes. Um, that was an astounding scene. Um, uh, also in this shenanigan um, comedy vein. Uh, and that's where Liza Titian um, has this unconscious fit of hatred and thoroughly um, embarrasses her fiance. Um, my translation calls him Maurice. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, well, uh, me, me, that's probably uh, Mavriki, Maurice, that's probably right. That makes sense. Um, so that, that's all I have. Um, I'd like to hear if anyone else uh, figured out any of these puzzles. All right. Doug, you're up. Uh, yeah, the thing that struck me partway through this reading, it's an around the point where the narrator says, well, now I'm going to tell everything that happened because it's eight days later and I can describe this. But I, I suddenly realized... I began to think of the demons in this story as the gossip and the stories that people tell and that somebody tells a story to someone else, they tell it to someone else. You know, Stefan writes a letter to his son, his son shows it uh, to uh, Varara Petrovna, uh, you know, and, and, and things that you don't expect family to do or best friends to do. They suddenly share a story you've told them and it, it's, it starts to spread like wildfire. And I actually live in a neighborhood in LA called Highland Park, which is like a small town in the middle of a huge megalopolis. And it's, it and it's, was started by artists in the 19th century and then became a rich suburb, then became a middle-class suburb, then became uh, a Latino neighborhood. One of the and Salvadoran gang, different gangs were here in the 90s. It was one of the most violent areas in LA. Now it's being gentrified, although the gangs are still here. So the way stories go through this community <laughs> and the way, and it's very volunteer oriented. So there are a lot of people that are on boards of directors and they all, and almost the smaller the board, the more they try to follow Robert's rules of order, which can turn completely ludicrous, you know, because you're meeting with five people and somebody is like, wants to follow Robert's rules of order, which are more suited to larger bodies than really, um, 
a small group that's just trying to be a work committee or something, but suddenly you're faced with these sort of, uh, you know, strange issues. And the way things zip through the town or the way memes move through our society or the way people get angry about a story, especially depending on who told you that. Oh, he told you that. Well, that's okay. But if he, somebody else told the story, then it's like poison. And then it's sort of, so the idea of stories, it, it, there's a point where they just get really, really dense. Like somebody hears something in a, in a group meeting or a, a group party and, and then there's all the gossip that emerges after that event. And then uh, maybe being around theater people, knowing a lot of funny people in my life who are like George Collar and theater people tend to gossip a lot. And they, they tend to tell stories. And once I made a random comment and I found it came back to me from the other end of the state. I mean, the next day it came back to me. Through, through a kind of channel of gossip that it wasn't actually a particularly harmful situation, but, but it could be, you know, these things like suddenly zip out and suddenly it's, it's all over the theater community on the West Coast. And so, uh, so Doug, since you mentioned this, can I ask you a question about this? Yeah. Uh, can you, do you get the impression, I absolutely agree that some of these demons could be these gossip stories and memes. Do you get the impression though, that it's not entirely um serendipitous that it's actually directed gossip meaning it's purposefully planted type of gossip that well that's what it. suddenly becomes more obvious in this book that these things are being placed like bombs almost to sort of go off or right. like right. they're really calculated uh and people are collecting these uh and you can almost see Peter, uh, is it Peter? Yeah, who just seems to collect this stuff and seems to go to people and have other people going to people to hear gossip and right. report it back. And then in terms of these political parties, uh, it starts to become very ominous, like people are in danger. And then you get to these silly scenes and you forget people are in danger. But, you know, you've just seen a scene where uh, somebody goes to warn somebody else, you know, you're in danger of being killed. And they go, well, so are you. And it's like, really? And what, where, and, you know, and so they start comparing stories and you wonder if even there, they're playing at each other rather than being honest with each other. Uh, well, so they, yeah, yeah. I, I hope it's creating a, a suspense that you guys are enjoying uh, because this is almost becoming like a detective uh, novel in a sense, uh, although it is meant to be more philosophical than, than purely about action, but uh, the action is stepping up and I hope everyone is is enjoying that. Uh, so I, at this point, I'm gonna- I wanted to make to other, I wanted to make one other point about the pranks and the jokes and the groups of people who play jokes because there is kind of a play fighting in theater where you're staging fights, you know, and they're play fights in a sense because they're to entertain an audience. Mm -hmm. But they can very easily turn into real fights. Like, oh, you didn't pull that punch. You really tried to hit me. And then boom, suddenly you have a fight in a rehearsal hall that's so they have to be very, very carefully managed. The other musical layering, there's a really incredible group in my neighborhood and they do a medley of Purple Rain that suddenly turns into Havana Gila and then they dovetail back and forth between each other, which reminds me of this musical parody. And when you have people who can be that funny, it can go wild. It's, it's play fun, it's, jo oh, can't you take a joke? And then it's not really a joke. I mean, as Freud said, every joke is, is an act of aggression. You know, that's what Freud said. So right. these things are all good fun, right? But they're not really, <laughs> some of them. Yeah, in Russia they say every joke has a part that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> every joke, so, what, say that again? Every joke has a part that's a joke. Hmm. And the rest is not <laughs> meaning. <laughs> okay, I'm. Um, I want to open it up to uh, everyone else to to uh, chime in and uh, share their impressions. But I do uh, actually, guys. Do you mind instead of raising your hand, do you mind putting an exclamation in the chat? That way, I can tell who uh, who goes first and so forth. Uh, we want to. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Great. Okay, we got a bunch of people. Okay. So just before just before this, I I, I want to frame the discussion maybe a little bit, and I I know uh, I maybe it's not too uh, not terribly fair of me uh, to do this, but I want to 
frame the discussion just a, a little bit. And, and here's the framing. Uh, what do you think about this idea of sacred and profane and how Dostoevsky is treating it? What, it, what is its role in society? Um, and what is its role in, in the plot? And, and is it a serious thing or is it some peripheral thing? Uh, so this is just one framing that I, I want to suggest. If you if you have something completely different, go ahead. But if you do have something to say about that, I think uh, maybe it's it's useful as well. So uh, with that, uh, uh, Allison and then uh, Joe. Um, I saw. I feel like I saw something totally different in this chapter. I mean, I've, I there were funny elements, but I feel like it it got dark really fast because it seemed to me that Peter was went to that party thing to spy on people. And he, you know, there's the whole big thing about Shatov and the, um, I forgot what they call them, the tracks, which I guess were these pamphlets that he'd been writing. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that they were, um, I mean, it seemed to me that he was on the verge of arresting him, but he wanted to go to see who else was in on it. So what I thought was funny about it though, was when they're, they're trying to have this meeting and they're like, should it be a meeting? Should it not be a meeting? And, but meanwhile, there's a spy who had infiltrated, which I thought was kind of funny because that was a lot like in the sixties when like they'd send these spies to go spy on college students who were clueless about how to do much of anything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it also- Plants, it's, plants, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plants. it reminded me a lot of, um, I felt like as I was reading it, I was like, this is like Nazi Germany. This is like Yugoslavia falling apart and people fighting against their enemies. And um, it, it just kind of like echoed a lot of things that have happened in the last 50 years in many different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it really made me wonder where this is going next. And, and what I thought was also interesting because I went back and looked at the dates that he wrote this, I guess, 45 years before the Russian revolution. So it's like he was writing about these things that he thought could happen and didn't happen, but it, you know, he was well ahead of his time, you know, projecting that all these things would happen. So, um, I mean, while there are funny elements, it's really like dark, dark humor at the same time. Um, that's, yeah, that's what I, I agree. Saying. I agree. Uh, Joe and then uh, CJ and Jeannie. So the problem is when you, when you talk to somebody about this, they kind of take everything that you're going to say. Uh, so, um, <laughs> that, so when, when, when I was talking to Allison about this, um, I agree that it actually turns very dark, uh, and then that you're just starting to see uh, Peter with his directed, as you guys had called it, directed gossip, starting to conspire against everyone else. But what's uh, you know also interesting is just a minor subplot, but it's not so minor. I mean, I I, I think it's interesting to see is. Um, uh, hang on, I come in, is when um, Vera Petrova uh, is is kind of becoming distant and pretty much uh, is ending her relationship with Stefan Trovovich. I think that that's a little bit more significant than people. It may first appear, um, you know, primarily because it's kind of like she's becoming more of a uh, more buying more into the modernity of the situation. Uh, and I, I think that whereas, you know, any kind of, you know, whereas I think uh, Stefan, whatever, Stefan, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, um, uh, still has this kind of, you know, I guess this reverence for the past. And I, I just think that that's something where you're kind of starting to see this dichotomy between the, the elders and, and I mentioned this a little bit before, and the youth, um, also the idea of the spy as well uh, was something that had really kind of stuck out for me too. And uh, the noble character aspect of things as well. Uh, that, that was also a very important point uh, in, this, in this section. Um, uh, as far as your question, I, I do wanna, I wanna come back to your question regarding the sacred and profane. Because uh, I think that that's a really significant uh, point in this, uh, in this, well, in the book, really, mm -hmm. uh, as far as, you know, how religion is being viewed in general. 
uh, and 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 it's it's almost as if um, you know it, it's being associated as we talked about a little bit before is more of it's a relationship with the nation and a community versus actually you know a religion in and unto itself like God in and of itself um, and I, I, I let me come back. Let me formulate my comments around okay, that. Okay, sure, sure. It's a complex that's, topic. It, it's a really complex topic. I mean, we did a, like an interesting meetup on Durkheim's perspective on this, and it's a really. I, I didn't think about applying it to this, but mm -hmm. I think it would be really, really interesting to explore. I that. wanted to bring up Durkheim, so you stole my idea. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad I stole somebody's idea. Yeah. No, I think yes. that that's actually a really important point. I want to come back to that. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Um, uh, CJ, Madeline, and then Maritza. It's Jeannie, not me. Oh, oh, Jeannie, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, <clears throat> I wanted to bring up Von Lemke. Um, last time, somebody said uh, how all these people are, are living in a fantasy. Well, him, more than ever, building his little model, you know, a church and all this. But it's interesting. This model is a Lutheran church. So there's also um, a dichotomy here of the Catholics or the Orthodox versus the Lutherans that are perhaps coming in. I'm wondering about the woman selling the Bible because that's probably another Protestant um, influence, you know, selling Bibles, I would think, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, to me, I, well, he, you know, he's German. So Lutheran churches, that makes sense because that's his, that's his uh, background. I wouldn't necessarily put too much into that except to say that, you know, I think men can identify with having a hobby like this. Um, but in some ways, it's kind of pathetic, right? Uh, he's a grown man. Here's a grown man, right? And he's building these little models of different things. And, and yet he's supposed to have this very high post, you know, a very responsible place in government. And what is he doing? What, how is he spending his time? He is building these little uh, trinkets, right? And writing uh, a book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as uh, selling Bibles, um, yes, I think that was, uh, that did not exist until recent 1800s, late 1800s, where they started the Protestant missionaries and uh, Protestant I guess centers uh, were allowed actually in Russia. Uh, but I think that the point that Dostoevsky is emphasizing more is the, the you know, the um, desecration part of it, not that he himself uh, was more like pro Russian Orthodox and wanted somehow to diminish the role of Russian Orthodox Church versus the Protestant Church. Because in the very next incident, what happens? It's the icon, right? The Russian icon, which is purely Russian Orthodox uh, phenomenon, and that's being desecrated. So everything is being desecrated, the Protestant, the Orthodox, uh, whichever way, and even that revolutionary idealism is being desecrated, right? When they combine those two songs, what is it doing? It's desecrating the, this idea of idealism and some sort of um, something that's greater than ourselves. And again, uh, you know, it's very easy to laugh at this kind of stuff, and I'm, I understand the, the humorous part of it, too, you know, but at the same time, try to make it personal and substitute Marseillaise for, I don't know, America the Beautiful or whatever, you know, whatever you consider sacred. Uh, think of anything that you think is like uh, impregnable, sacrosanct. Uh, um, I, I can think of a, a number of things that are sacrosanct in this country that people may you know, may think that America is such a sort of no holds barred country, but definitely not anymore. I mean, there's certain things you can get fired for uh, and uh, become a pariah. So there's definitely things that are, that are sacred in that sense, right? That you dare not profane. Um, so make it, you know, it's not just a phenomenon in, in Russian or religious con um, context. It's a phenomenon that, it, that seems to be, uh, um, what's the word? Um, prevalent in society in general, uh, just the, people may disagree what they consider sacred, but the, there's definitely, it seems to be a need to somehow um, orient people around something that's sacred. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up the time uh, from uh, Madeline. Uh, go ahead and then Maritza. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, good. Um, well, to me, I feel like we're really into the heart of the book here. Um, the seeds that have been planted have sprouted and now we're seeing them blossom. Uh, we haven't seen the full fruits yet, but we're seeing the flowers. We're seeing what a nasty piece of work Pyotr Stepanovich really is behind the scenes. Oh my God. Um, what to me, I, I do see this, the theme of the sacred and profane, but uh, what I'm seeing is what I think is actually the central theme of the book, which is writing. Um, the written word keeps cropping up here and it has earlier. Uh, and I think it's a very important thing. Um, I felt very much actually for Von Lemke. Um, I think more than uh, Karamazinov, he really was an artist. In other words, he was working away in obscurity. He was creating entire little worlds. Uh, the only person he trusted, you know, to truly care about him, who or should have, would have been his wife. Mm -hmm. And she kept taking them away from him because they were embarrassing. Uh, he's writing a novel. And, you know, he knows that these aren't going to be great works for the ages. But at the same time, he feels compelled to do it and finds uh, peace and happiness in it. So I agree there's something childish about it. But at the same time, um, it's sort of a touching contrast, almost in the German romantic strain, that someone who's such a good officer and administrator type would have this sort of secret, playful side of world building. Um, this, had, this section had some of my favorite scenes in it. Um, not just that the icon was robbed, but that a mouse was put in its place. Um, the mouse is lowly, it is dirty, it eats grain. Um, although it is humble. And um, icons are not only, they're not representations of the sacred, they actually are sacred. So they are actual instantiations of the divine in the world. Um, I think my two favorite howlingly funny scenes were the one with the saint. I think we're seeing uh, what Dostoevsky's opinions about religion really are which is here's this guy, he's just giving stuff out at random. Get, you know, more sugar for this one, tea for that one. It makes absolutely no sense. And it's made very clear indeed. Um, the only person who, could, who actually seems to desperately need help is the peasant woman whose children have abused her. And she gets sent away with sugar loaves. Uh, so I think this is Dostoevsky's uh, opinion of sainthood and religion and how much it helps people in the world. Um, the other scene I loved was the one at Virginsky's. It was the vote of the conspirators. For anyone who has ever belonged to a community organization like a community garden or a church or anything, even for those of us who, who were born and raised in democracy, it's, it's the same thing over and over. What are we voting on? Are we voting yes or no? What does this mean? Was I supposed to raise my hand? I just, I couldn't stop laughing with that one. Um, and also in that scene, it was oddly prescient um, because he did, he did talk about um, the many millions who would have to die in order for all these plans to take place. And uh, horribly enough, many millions did die. Yep. So let's see. Um, I think the theme of suicide is coming along here. Uh, we have the visit to the corpse. And I, I actually thought that this was, uh, that this was a detail from Dostoevsky's life. This has happened to someone he knew or something because it could easily just have been it could have been any corpse. There didn't have to be a backstory for the death. And it would have been just as horrible that they were going to a hotel, to an inn to see this. So I had the feeling this it was important to him on a personal level to include this story, although we may never know why. Um, let's see. Yeah, I thought that the, um, I read to the end of part two, which also include, went through chapter 10. Was that the correct thing to do? Uh, well, we haven't covered, uh, we, we only we stopped at seven. 
So uh, okay, I won't yeah. I won't go into those scenes then. Okay. Um, but I'm glad you're you're so excited about it that you you went all all the way to the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, uh, the Spiegel and Factory, mm -hmm. um, which is getting mentioned. Uh, this is really the first we've seen uh, in terms of industrialization in Russia, mm -hmm. um, which is actually what Marx was based on, which was uh, yep. the bourgeois were the owners of the means of production. So that would have been like the Spigulins, yep. um, mm -hmm. not like the peasants who were working the land. Correct. Um, yes, we have lovely Mavriki Nikolaevich uh, trying to give his fiance away. And uh, <laughs> and um, let's see. I think that okay. Those are going to come after chapter seven. So yeah, I think that the whole thing is kind of unfolding. Um, it's like a multi generational family saga. So uh, or like an like a long running soap opera, except with truly horrible consequences. And Fetka, uh, the convict, his name is Fyodor. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one in the novel, I think, who was actually imprisoned in Siberia, like our author, Fyodor. Uh, so I think he's got a little bit of, you know, his memories of his days there and the types of desperate men that he met uh, while he was in that, that mm -hmm. gulag system. Yep. Um, also, there was the first, this mention of the Sistine Madonna, Mm -hmm. I think that ties in uh, with what um, who who uh, Jeannie was saying earlier about Lutheranism. It's basically we've got three kinds of Christianity going on in this brief section. Uh, we have Roman Catholicism in the form of the Sistine Madonna. We have the icon, and then we have uh, that uh, poor Bible Bible mm -hmm. peddler lady. Yep. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, this was a great overview. Uh, and I really do appreciate you giving us a different perspective on von Lemke. Uh, I, I, I think it's great uh, that you noticed this sort of like these aspects of humanity that are really dear to Dostoevsky's heart. And even though I, I still stand by my comments on the childishness of it all, but guess what? We're, we're human and we all have those places and parts of our lives where we want to be childish we want to be uh silly and as, even as adults and Dostoevsky he you know, that's his genius is he doesn't give you like something predictable uh and his character development is so rich where it becomes so believable like you think there's a character that that that, that there's probably a guy named von Nemke somewhere <laughs> because he's so vivid in our mind that we can picture him with all his quirks and his indecision and his uh, sort of uh, appeasing of his wife and at the same time being mad at her for keeping things from him. I mean, it's just like, there's so many uh, aspects to a person, right? In different contexts. And, and Dostoevsky is a master uh, psychiatrist, psychologist. I'm not sure what he, uh, just a, a person who can really create these portraits that uh, I, I keep talk, thinking of Rembrandt you know, that are, that are fathomless. They are, they recede into the darkness of human psyche and the darkness of human being. And at the same time, there's that light in the eyes, the eternity uh, that, that, that is captured in them. And uh, that's, that's the amazing part to me is reading about these characters that have so much depth to them. Um, and then Dostoevsky really shows that. Uh, Maritza, you're up. Um, the one word that just kept popping into my head as I'm reading this as absurd. This is just absurd. Come on. Um, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it's some parts you just, all you can do is laugh. Um, I, what I see here is, well, I see a picture being painted to us that's a very strong um, dichotomy of religions. Um, specifically, the, where we're being set up, I mean, I, I think that it's going to get bigger. They, they haven't been huge parts yet, but, you know, I think that the, there's a contrast between Shatov and uh, Kirillov. I'm sure I'm saying the names wrong, but, you know, oh, one of them <laughs> is the atheist, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them is the one that 
wants to believe in God, wants but to believe, yeah. mm-hmm. has none. And so, but when um, Peter is, you know, he's trying to, you know, somehow he's trying to throw one of them under the bus and save the other one. And um, I feel like that's a commentary on the fact of, you know, oh, this one's just the atheist, he's disposable. Um, that's what I, I feel like the, the author is saying to us there. Um, and you see it in a lot of the other, like when you look at the, some of the, the just inane characters that are brought up, they're just, they're, there's a little like small commentary thrown in onto their status of religion. And I, I think that the ones who are not viewed as being of the proper, you know, religion tend to be a little bit more shown as um, maybe more, um, I don't know, less important, more trivial. Um, but I don't know, that's just my impression I, that there, there's a picture being painted here for us and a, a religious statement being interwoven throughout all the characters. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Um, there's also the, um, the idea of um, pain and suffering mm-hmm. also. It, it seems to be because this, this uh, Kirillov guy is really quite just pathetic. Like he's like, you know, nothing's worth living. I'm supposed to be only about pain and suffering. I'm going to let somebody else even pick my own suicide date, which is really just, dude, if you're going to kill yourself, at least pick your own date. Um, he's, <laughs> he's not. It's, to me, that's, it's, but he is, it, he does, metaphor. he does uh, insist that it is his, his will, you know, it's my he volition does, only. Which I find to be just, again, to me, that's absurd because it's not your will if someone else is dictating the date. I mean, I suppose technically it's your will because on that date, you can decide to opt out. So sure. Okay. Fair. Um, and what I, I wanted to hear in his fierce statement that it was his will, I wanted to hear the petition for true free will, but I just can't get there because he's so very much nothing matters. So it's it's hard. Like I wanted to hear that. I wanted to hear that like, you know, grandiose ultimate, you know, it's free will, but I just mm-hmm. didn't get there with with that with him. So so that was a that was a character that I was like, I don't know what's coming for you, but I just suspect it's just gonna be sad. And he's really it, there's a he's a metaphor, is what I'm seeing. I think that he's really just a placeholder there for a grander statement that that we're being um, told. Um, but I suppose technically that's most of these characters, right? Um, the the something else when we're you know we stay, all this description of these um, weird I mean it's it's almost laughable the, the crazy all the the jokes and the pranks and the it's so weird um, no it's it's not my first Russian novel but um, <laughs> the, it's just it's so crazy to me the idea that so much time is spent on these you know little weird um, happenings that are laughed off and shrugged off. And what I think also, what I think it's about is again, we're getting these metaphors, you know, this is a, it's a grand novel. And what I'm seeing is that I'm being painted a picture of a very sick community. And this community is so sick that the, these random things are how they amuse themselves. And it, interestingly, the, the, the person telling the tale tells us, you know, I'm telling you this eight days after it happened. And he's, he says that ultimately the blame is placed upon the shoulders of the wife of the governor. Um, and like they, they say, ultimately it's, it's, it's her fault. People, was, you know, he doesn't say it's her fault actually, which is again, interesting. He says, it's generally held in belief that it's her fault, mm-hmm. which, okay, way to commit. Um, but so so it's it's um well it's the narrator so according to cj he's not reliable anyway (laughs) indeed indeed (laughs) um so the what i'm seeing here is you you asked about the arcane and the um, sacred Mm -hmm. i think we're being shown here a view and and this is not i i don't think that i'm in agreement with this but what i'm seeing is that we're showing how frivolous these individuals are. 
and they come together in a community, but they're still so frivolous that they're ineffective. Um, and they're pinging off each other. But the thing that's interesting to me is that you see the same interaction with the frivolous group that goes to see the suicide boy and that ultimately to the, um, the sacred saint guy. Mm -hmm. You see the same societal interactions with them that you see when you're looking at the meeting. So here mm -hmm. in this meeting, these people are these, the, you know, these men, because the women who are there are like by pure accident or circumstance of birth, they're not actually the invited ones to the meeting. They're selected and they're part of this meeting, but they interact with the same childish, I don't know, like lack of conviction that do the, the society ladies, and I guess the couple of gentlemen that go to view the, um, the saint. It's the same, I gotta look to somebody to see which way I'm gonna vote. I don't know why I'm voting yes, but so-and-so voted yes, so I'm going to as well. Mm -hmm. And it was like, follow the leader kind of thing. When I think that there's a profound statement being shown to us here in both of those, because technically they're entirely different scenarios and you wouldn't expect them to be so similar, but I really was struck by how, to me, it was the same exact thing being shown to me just in an entirely different way. So um, I don't know what that means for the rest of the book, but um, I'm seeing here this, um, you know, this group of individuals in this entire little town here, not a one of them truly knows, or maybe not a one, maybe not not a one of them, most of them, because I, mm -hmm. I believe even if he's using it for ill games, Peter has a stronger sense of self than most of the other people with whom we're being introduced. Well, Barbara does as well, um, mm -hmm. because at least I, I am envisioning that she does. Right. But all the others are so very lost. They're like children, like they have to look at someone. Right. They don't know which way we want to go. And I mean, th something that I did think was fascinating about the meeting was the constant reference to we don't want to keep, we don't want to just keep talking about it. We want to actually do something. Right. And um, I think that that, that, again, I think that might be a portent for how things are going to play out later in the, in the right. book. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. Right. And I, just one more thing. I want to talk just briefly for mm -hmm. um, about the um, CJ, one question if it was a breakup between Vavara and um, um, mm -hmm. Stefan. I, I think it was, and I, what was interesting to me, and again, the word absurd came to mind, that Stefan actually said that he was, he had never thought that he was being a freeloader. Dude, she's sending you money every month. She's, you're, you're living in her house. She's giving you servants. What did you think you were? But it was, I couldn't tell if what we were supposed to get out of this was that this was a man who actually did have some personal dignity or mm -hmm. if it was a mockery of a, a, an undeserved self-righteousness i'm undecided still on how that stands i guess we'll see where well, i mean keep, she, an, open mind. Didn't keep an open mind uh, yes <laughs> she totally didn't see him um right. she, she was like sure we'll see you'll see you'll come back you'll be needing that pension you'll be back in our circles right. um because he said he was going to go you know Right. off without her and not take anything from her yeah. yeah and and i i wonder if that if you look at him deeper it's almost a tragic image of somebody who's floating through life with no true aim or purpose and someone else is bankrolling this aim he can he has the freedom to not think to not really do because somebody else is handling everything for him. When he's like literally given the boot, he's he kind of sees things in a different light for the first time. 
and he feels that that's not how he perceived his life to have been going. So I think that that's, again, that's another commentary on a sick society. If your society is sick, you can even have individuals who think they're being upright, you know, citizens and individuals, but in actuality, they're just floating moochers. So um, those are- uh, oh, Okay, okay. Thank you, Marissa, that, that was great. Um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot there to, to reflect on for sure. Um, Okay, so uh, we, we have a couple of people, uh, Madeline and Doug, but I just wanna uh, frame another question perhaps. We talked about sacred and profane and probably we should come back to it at some point. But I want to uh, also raise this question to you. What do you think about uh, Pyotr Stepanovich, uh, Verkhovensky, the son of Stepan Trofimovich? He seems to be this master puppeteer, this person who wears a multitude of masks, who hides and plans and essentially uh, schemes to have this whole town in, a, in an uproar. One way or another, we, we're starting to realize that he's behind everything that has been happening. The intrigue, the, uh, even the breakup of, of Arvara Petrovna and his father is really his fault because he went to one, then he went to the other. And uh, essentially uh, he said, she said, and, um, but here's the question. He's wearing all these masks. What is he really uh, like? Does he have, uh, you mentioned he might have a, a, a sense of self that's stronger than other people. Well, I'm curious what you guys think about, does he have, uh, what, what is his sense of self? Why is he doing, what, is, what are his motives? What, what is he doing? Why is he doing it? Um, anyway, just an open uh, kind of question to frame the discussion. Uh, Madeline and then Doug. Uh, yeah, Phil, sorry, I actually uh, wanted to talk about Kirillov. Is no that problem. okay? No problem. We can come back to, we can come back to these. Okay, so um, Maritza, thank you so much. Brava. That was wonderful. And uh, Phil, I absolutely loved what you said about uh, the people in this being like the people in the Rembrandt portraits. Um, with the small human touches and that deep, deep gloomy darkness and then that the beautiful light creating the chiaroscuro it really it's it's a perfect image for them uh i think kirillov uh i i picked up on this theme from what maritza was saying he's a very interesting character um he's the only one in the book who is actually free in the sense that he's like you know i can just leave at any time um and i think that on the theme of the sacred and profane uh, the thing, you know, the thing that churches usually hold most sacred is life, just the simple fact of life. Mm -hmm. And unlike many people who uh, tell other people that they're going to commit suicide, um, he's not holding anyone hostage. He's not saying, you know, this is all so unsatisfactory. I'm going to kill myself unless you change something. He's just saying, I'm going to do this. And so he has a freedom um, that no one else in the book has. He has stated outright that he is not going to arrange the date to suit someone's cause, although he's willing to. He's, ba he's basically saying, you can make of my death whatever you want to, but it is not going to be, whatever you make of it is not going to be the real reason for it. And so for him to be taking contemplating at least taking his own life in that way and therefore making himself a god um i think this goes back to the old christian beliefs of only god can determine when someone lives or dies i don't really understand is he thinking that then he will be um sort of a new messiah for atheists or what exactly is happening in this scene um I mean, I, I actually do find him to be one of the most sympathetic characters, oddly enough. Um, he's, he's, I don't he's know, very he's rash. Nice. He's very nice in his dealings with other people. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's playing ball with the little girl. He's, he's helping the old lady. Um, you know, he's, he's not a terrible human being. He's desperately poor. And uh, he has some prospects because he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. And he just 
you know, for whatever his reasons are, doesn't want to keep going with it all and thinks that, I guess he thinks that his death would serve the world better than his life does. So is yeah, he I, supposed to be some sort of Christ-like figure? Yeah, I think he's a very misunderstood character. And I know like Maritza uh, uh, raised some, some of her questions and maybe uh, misgivings or, or thoughts about him. Here's how, I, I actually, I can understand him to a degree. I don't know, maybe it's, uh, um, he has this idea and, and again, maybe not a lot of people can identify with this, but I, um, I find that I can maybe in an odd way. He has this idea, and think, think about it like this maybe. Let's say you are in your 30s. You're full of life. You're at the apex of your career, at your physical development, mental development. From now on, everything you see, you see society is deteriorating. You see everything around you, your friendships and maybe uh, people that you thought were worthwhile to, you know, going downhill. Um, you want to capture the moment like Faust and not let it go right now when you're at the top of your game and not wait till you are 70 decrepit and dying from disease. So in a way what he's doing is something like what Nietzsche was talking about having the ubermensch, the person who is the, the man God, right? That's what his big idea is, man God. What is the ultimate thing that God can decide? Like you mentioned, it's life, giving of life, taking of life, which traditionally was viewed as a prerogative of divinity. And in this case, he is saying that I want to decide. I didn't decide when I was born, but I want to decide at least when I go. That's his big thing. And also he thinks that he can crystallize it, this perfect moment of being by taking his life. Now he's just deferring it in a way. <laughs> and it, it reminded me, uh, I'm reading something else in another group. Uh, we're reading uh, Diogenes Laertes' uh, Lives of Eminent Philosophers. And one of them, Tales, said at one point, there's no difference between living and dying. And then someone else said, well, why didn't you die? He said, because there's no difference. <laughs> and and in some ways, this is, reminds me of Kirillov. Uh, people were saying, "Well, why 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 do you let somebody else plan your exit date, so to speak?" Because there's no difference. It's the perfect moment at that time, and there's a perfect moment at this time, and I can wait. And if you want to use it in some way, sure, I'll let you do it. Because he's kind of a nice guy, right? Like, like we mentioned, he kind of goes along at the same time as being a rebel and a nihilist. Uh, so that's. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave there, and Doug, maybe you have something to say about that as well. Yeah, my thoughts are going in a lot of different directions. I, I, I kind of love what Maritza talked about in terms of the freeloader issue, but the thing, and I've been pondering this most of my life in terms of um, since the 11th grade, and I began to had a great English literature teacher that kind of pushed me from science, math into literature and eventually theater. But the idea of the patron that Shakespeare had, that Dante had, they're in exile. They create works that last hundreds of years or a thinker or a philosopher, the patron. So the, the person who thinks they're gonna do a work of genius, there's sort of a, I don't know if it's tragedy or comedy in a character who doesn't think of himself as a freeloader because he's gonna create a great work at some point and uh, like Shakespeare or something. He has a patron who's supporting his important work. And clearly he thinks he's got some important work in his back pocket, but every time he's about to stand up as, in a political movement or doing, he, he gets cold feet, he gets his knees crumble. He's, he's sort of building on sand and he falls apart. So he does not really perceive himself as a freeloader. And this is the dark night of the soul. I think for every artist sort of go, have I lost it? Did I have it? Did I ever have it? Do I still have it? Do I, you know, I mean, so it's a, it's a really interesting issue. And I think Dostoevsky was not only almost executed and right to the point of they were firing the guns and they didn't kill him. Mm -hmm. But he also was on the firing line from artists like Turgenev and other people. So it feels to some degree that Dostoevsky is just getting his own back. His last novel, his last work is just trashing all the political movements and all the artists he's ever known. So are they cheap shots or are they genius? You know, 
according to Camus, they're genius. You know, he, he was obsessed by this book and loved it. So to me, that's the sort of, that's why I find it so funny as an artist. I see myself in so many of these characters where you think, you know, and, I, and the Black Panther movement, for example, was really in a way led by the women who did the education and the kitchens and feeding people. And the male leaders were posing and pontificating, and some of them were deadly serious and, and actual maybe martyrs. Many of the leaders worked for the FBI. So it was sort of like, who's working for who? And in many countries where the men like kill each other, I know a guy who studies these areas of genocide, it's the women who build, build the country back up because the men have all killed each other. They've all been out posing and firing at each other. And so the, there's a very, I think Dostoevsky is getting right to the heart of what does it mean to take political action in a given time and place. And I think while his, he has certain biases, I think the novel goes way beyond any position he has. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you, I think everybody he's, can- He's of, wonderful. He is wonderful in that he gives you believable characters on every possible side of the argument. Right. He doesn't just give you cartoonish characters of the side that he doesn't personally endorse. And also what's helpful is the fact that he journeyed in his life. He was a socialist in his youth and supported these progressive liberal ideas. So his uh, portrayal of the people on that side who are meant to uh, mimic real persons like Belinsky, Chernyshevsky, Gertsen, uh, some of the people that he mentions in, 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 in the work or mentions uh, their works, or even Turgenev, who is not really a revolutionary, but a, a writer about some of these revolutionary ideas, like not like nihilism. Um, uh, they all they all have both um, attractive and, and perhaps uh, uh, some of the less attractive qualities, but but they're real people, and it gives them that humanity that is absent, you know, a lot of times, like I was thinking of like Ayn Rand uh, and, and her uh, portrayal of the capitalist and also the, the other side that she didn't like. And, her, and the problem with her books is not that uh, necessarily that you can disagree with her or agree with her. The problem is she paints these cartoonish characters that are so un, unrealistic. I mean, if you wanted to portray a person like, um, I forget the name of the guy in Atlas Shrugged, the, um, the main character there, but uh, if you wanted to portray somebody like that, portray Elon Musk, you know, who, who has the, the negative qualities and the positive qualities or, or Bezos, or you can, you can make it, but, but her characters are either black or white. And that's, that's a problem. Whereas the Stajewski's characters are gr all, all shades of possible colors. I mean, you got the, I don't want to say shades of gray because his colors are vivid. They are vivid <laughs> in in all kinds of black and 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 yellow and some satirical reddish and well reddish would be more violent maybe but maybe satirical of blues and greens and so forth uh, and there's satire and there's tragedy and that's how life is right it's satire and tragedy all at the same time intertwined and uh, that's what makes it so uh, memorable I guess to me is these characters that they they really encapsulate life. Um, anyway, sorry to, to again jump in here. Uh, who, uh, if you want to go next, uh, uh, please go ahead and type in exclamation point. I, I'm yeah. going to say a few more things. I wanted to say a few more things about the context because some of you may not be aware of some of these works that Dostoevsky is um, being in a, a, a conversation with. One of them is a work by uh, Chernyshevsky. I don't know if any of you uh, have read or heard of him. He wrote um, a book called The Vital Question, a novel, um, in which we have this uh, female char uh, main, main character. Her name is uh, 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 Vera Nikolaevna, I think. Uh, Vera, anyway. Uh, and uh, she has these dreams. And in these dreams, she dreams of these utopias. And part of these utopias are being criticized here by uh, Dostoevsky. And he brings up, he, uh, he makes some references to this work. Uh, so I, I, I actually found there's a, a, a translation of this, of this book on, um, on archive, uh, archive.org. So I'm going to share this with you. Uh, uh, 
and take a peek at a couple of these dreams. Uh, you don't have to read, read the whole thing. The whole thing is, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, but you don't have to read the whole thing to understand the, uh, the, um, uh, the point. But the point being is, he, uh, Chernyshevsky paints this utopian society of where women are free, everybody's free to work uh, or not work, contribute. Uh, and then, of course, the reality is very different. She also has this um, uh, uh, love interest in her life and leaves her husband for it. But she tells him honestly, and that's kind of this revolutionary morality, meaning uh, women and men should be free to enter and exit relationships as they want to. This this marriage thing is a bourgeois um, uh, by a prejudice that we've lived. It's a it's an economic arrangement, right? Uh, that's that's the sort of the revolutionary socialist claim, especially if you read the Communist Manifesto, it's all right there about uh, the relationships between sexes and marriage as a contract, right? It's, you know, the, the claim is that marriage is really a contract because it's all about property. You know, if it wasn't about property and child support and things like that, then we really don't need this institution of marriage. It's, it's bogus. Uh, that's the claim. Uh, Dostoevsky, of course, uh, is much more conservative and he very much um, disputes this claim, both in this book, as we see with his portrayals of various relationships between men and women, uh, which are also free to experiment. Uh, and we have a lot of couples experimenting here. If you remember Virgins uh, Virginsky's uh, wife, uh, Arina, I uh, forget her, uh, um, her uh, name now. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the midwife, she told her husband that she wants, she prefers Libatkin of all people. <laughs> Libatkin, of course, is this hilarious character you remember, who makes these wonderful poems about um, cockroaches and, and so forth. Uh, and also fancies uh, Elisaveta while he's being courted by a married woman. Uh, so we have a lot of these uh, sort of uh, experimentation going on in the novel, and we're free to imagine we're free to, I guess, imagine how, how this would map to the real world. And that's another thing that Dostoevsky does, I think, in this novel is allows us to experiment and imagine how things could, could work, potentially, if we try to implement some of these revolutionary ideas. And um, anyway, that's another framing, I think, for me uh, of, this, of this novel. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts or, or, or uh, ideas about that. Uh, CJ, go ahead, and then Allison. Yeah, I, I was going to comment on uh, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, my difficulty, one of my difficulties in reading the text is that Peter has been so maligned by the narrator that I don't trust his character. And I'm having tremendous difficulty keeping in mind what he says to whom and what whom interprets from each you know made up story um you, you know did um di did von lemke agree not to arrest shatov until a week and turn him over to peter what well, you know what is going some of it is so hard to follow because it's conditionals on implausible premises and i just haven't read it over and over again enough to to get that logic and be able to follow it and so i'm just moving through like you know peter said a bunch of stuff and different people took it different ways and and i'm really not it's not tightly registering exactly what's going on. I, I get, you know, a, a bunch of it. I have a feeling, but I don't, I can't really trace the logic. And that's, that's got me disoriented. Well, if you, if you, uh, here's, a uh, here's a hint. Uh, whatever, whatever he says he's doing, he's doing, take the opposite of that. And that's probably what he's doing. <laughs> because, 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 uh, because uh, when, when he when says he wants says to rescue Shaka, it's similar to, you know, you going up to um, somebody in HR in a company says, you know, I want to rescue somebody. I want to really prevent them from going any further. You know, they've said some of these racial slurs and they've also done 
um, you know, address some women without propriety. I really want to rescue them. What do you think is going to happen to that person who you tried to rescue? I mean, it's pretty obvious that you're not rescuing them at all. You put, you're actually throwing them under the bus by uh, saying that you're going to rescue them. So God, God save us from people who try to rescue us uh, like that. Uh, so he, his motives are very much uh, 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 in question, to say the least, when he says he wants to rescue somebody. And he's been rescuing people from the start and rescuing from misunderstandings and throwing people uh, under the bus left and right. Uh, you know, the relationship between Varvara and uh, Stepan Trofimovich is, uh, is ended because of what he had done. He had uh, published letters that are, were written in confidence to yeah. each other. Including uh, his father. Thing. And, and now, of course, they're both uh, aghast that their secrets most uh, they were, you know, to be kept uh, between them are now sort of public uh, in public domain. And um, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, but, but the question remains, what are his motives? What, what are Peter's motives? What does he really, what is he really after this guy? He is not, a, he is not an easy character to penetrate. Uh, and I'm um, uh, sorry. Um, who was next? Um, Allison, and then uh, Madeline. Um, I was thinking about how the, the things that these people are doing could be applied to any country, any time in history. So I think the whole reason that revolutions don't work is because you see, oh, these people they're doing these evil things. Let's just get rid of them. So throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's bring in this new thing. And whatever you call the new thing, it never works because the government may change, but the people are the same. So you bring in a whole bunch of new cast of characters and then they do all the same things that the old cast of characters did because that's human nature. <laughs> There's a famous fable, uh, I think it's Aesop's fable about the animals changing places in an or orchestra. They yeah. think that uh, you know it's gonna sound better because they change from you know, a cellist is going to take the, the trumpeter's guy, a, a trumpeter's place, and a drummer is going to become, a, you know, a bass player and so forth. But of course, if you can't play any of the instruments, it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. which seat exactly. you're taking. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Madeline and then Doug. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, um, first of all, speak speak a little bit to Doug's point um, and actually disagree with it, uh, which was uh, one of the few things I've ever disagreed with that Doug has said uh, about the uh, social movement in which the men were prominent and the women were doing the cooking and the cleaning and everything. That was simply a replication of what the men were rebelling about uh, based on skin color, only now it was based on gender. And so I think that in terms of uh, the young woman at Forginsky's, mm -hmm. who is keeps intruding with her issues about the woman problem and the college students, um, I think what she's trying to say is that unless those imbalances are addressed, we are going to keep replicating everything over and over again, just like what Allison was saying. Um, as far as those six days of grace, for Shatov, that Pyotr Stepanovich has begged from Lemka. Uh, there was a point, I believe it was a little earlier on, where Nikolai Stavrogan said to Pyotr Stepanovich, uh, I think that you should get your conspirators to kill Shatov. It would bind them, it would bind the four together. They would never speak, they would never betray you. Mm -hmm. And the narrator says, it passed through Pyotr Stepanovich's mind, or it must have, that this was a terrible thing. So in other words, the, the narrator is kind of in the guy's mind, kind of isn't, he's kind of speculating. So Stavrogan has actually come up with this idea. And it seems as if um, Pyotr Stepanovich is really working hard against it. He's trying to save Shatov. Now, why on earth would he care about Shatov, really? Um, I just don't see Shatov as someone he would care about. Um, I mean, Shatov is a kind of, uh, well, okay, so he was a serf of 
Wait, whose surf was he? Was he uh, the staff? Uh, I believe Starogan. Uh, okay. But, yeah, yeah, because it was Varvara that freed him. So, I mean, essentially, it, it was he was a Starogan surf. And that was right. one of the uh, reasons, by the way, that was given why Stavrogin never uh, challenged him to a duel. Because how can you challenge a person that's you know so much below you? That's that's just not what you do. Yes, <laughs> yes, an indicator of Stavrogin's nobility. Right, right. You don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering why it is suddenly so important to uh, Pyotr Stepanovich that Shatov be saved, and I think it's. It's part of what CJ was talking about, which is that what uh, what this guy is doing, it's so bollocked up. It's so convoluted. It's so confused. He's saying this to this person. He's saying that to that person. But he is basically um, presenting everything in the to people sort of in the worst light, mm -hmm. um, but under the guise of helping them or revealing the truth to them. Yep. But it's so one-sided. Um, I don't know, it's it's this sort of malicious uh, nihilism that it's very disturbing and, and indeed very confusing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. We have Doug, Maritza, and Mike. Doug, go ahead. Are you muted, Doug? I think the clarification on the point I made about women and their role is that the, the women really, the men bragged that they were educating children and feeding children. The women were the guts of keeping the organization going and doing all the stuff that the men bragged about. I mean, that's sort of what I meant, a more, uh, and in some countries where the men end up killing each other in these genocides, the women rebuild the whole society. And sometimes arts are a big part of that. Uh, in places like Rwanda and other countries. So, uh, but I think yeah, that's a really good point she brought up. I, I, I think I kind of misspoke or misrepresented that. Um, it's, uh, but I don't want to continue on that. The one brief point I have to say about Peter and his motivation, mm -hmm. I think his father failed him. He didn't raise him. He didn't do anything. And he didn't become a great artist like Goethe or Shakespeare or Dante. Mm -hmm. And that's a double betrayal. So I think his anger is to destroy everything and all the pretense of artists and philosophers and thinkers and politicians. And he's just out to destroy you know, right. anybody's pretenses. Uh, Doug, do you remember when we were going through Dante, uh, that meeting with Beatrice, and you said that Dante did not, uh, what Beatrice chided him about was the fact that he did not fulfill his potential right. as an artist. I think that pretty much uh, maybe harkens to that in a sense, right? Uh, that Exactly. And that's the, that's the artist's dark night of the soul. You had a vision once in your life and you failed it. You know, that's what's mm -hmm. terrifying for an artist or a poet or, you know. Right, right. Okay, thank you. And uh, the son who is, is neglected for this great career that is a fraud, I think his his anger is lethal. It's just like right. he's not uh, forgiving he's lot, his yeah, father. He has a lot, to, he has a lot pinned up. Um, he's not Marit forgiving the patriarchy. He's not forgiving anything. Right. You know. uh, Maritza and then Mike. And then Joe. An interesting thing about um, Piotr is um, that he's he kind of is like friendly to all, but not friendly to any at the same time. Okay, not everyone because he's just downright nasty to his father. But in general, he's seen he he's trying to present himself as um, kind of a conspirator with everyone. But he's so it's just it's the way that it's he's presenting in the writing. I, I find it to be I mean it's brilliant writing, like he, because he has such a lack of respect. And he does these things that are like so rude. Like who would ask their host for scissors to cut their nails at a meeting that he himself instigated? That's like, I'm sorry. If I invite you to a dinner party and you ask me for nail clippers, I'm kicking you out. I just am. Just be, be forewarned, folks. Kicking you out. Um, but he does it. And then what struck me is the it's presented as it's okay for him because the hostess is ashamed that she's appalled by his request. 
because she's like, this is just normal, ordinary doings. It should be okay for the common person to want to clip their fingernails in public at a meeting that he orchestrated. Right, Marissa, and, but let me let me make it a little more real for you. How about it's a person that you admire? Let's say it's somebody like um, Barack Obama that comes to your house and asks you for clippers. Will you still kick him still out? They'll kick you out. I'm sorry. Barack, okay. you better have okay. better home okay. training. <laughs> yeah, better okay. have better but home training. But I think training. a lot of people will not. That's my point. Right. No, absolutely. And so so that but that's the fascinating <laughs> thing that <laughs> that's the fascinating thing about what we're shown. And it's again, it's just another. To me, it's another knock on the sickness of these individuals that make up this community, how they just are so unsure of themselves and what they do or don't believe that they feel this need to look to others. So because this group that's brought together here, they all view Peter as this very, um, you know, he he's above all of them. They think that he's this, like, you know, he's the orchestra. They don't really know what they think of him, to be honest, right? but they somehow believe he's more important than they are. And because he acts in such disregard for the niceties of proper society, it's reinforced in them. But then in addition to that, they he's forcing them to accept things that they would personally be very against. And um, I think that that's, that's why I think he's like a brilliant puppet master because he's taking and he has this un erring way of looking at someone and finding just the right thread to pull to unravel mm -hmm. and i think that we're going to see that as a spiraling crescendo as the book goes forward um and I, I, he and he does it in a way where he people just think that he's like their buddy mm -hmm. and i don't know it's uh um, so he's a he's, he's an smart. interesting one i'm, I'm sorry mm -hmm. he's smart if nothing else he's ruthless but he's oh smart. absolutely but the problem is that so is the governor the governor's very smart it's not a question of like, he's not, it's not that he's the only smart one that's being presented here. He's oh, yeah. just oh, yeah. the, he's, he's the one with more deceptive mind. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. again, he's the one also that we've been told that he's a nihilist, right? So I think that the, what we're being told here, again, that the moral, right? He, he's, I think what he's really trying to beat out of everyone is the concept of moral in integrity. And so that's what I think that he's going after more so than like, you know, you have the threads of the different religions, but I, I think that he's actually, because when you look at the people that he's kind of beating on the most, it's the ones who seem to have their own little internal, a little bit stronger internal moral compass. So I don't know, right, those are just right. my thoughts on him. Thank you. Uh, Mike and then Joe. Uh, part of the reason why I think Dostoevsky is still on the um, horizon here is that it's uh, that just as it was applicable to the freeing of the serfs and the um, uh, intrigue and conspiracy that went on at that time, it's also applicable to the Ukraine situation that's going on right now. Um, you, you, uh, Putin is trying to. In the, uh, to implement Brezhnev's doctrine and gamble and conspiracy culture that he's got right now. We have the dimension of sex uh, in um, Hunter Biden's um, uh, oil, oil conspiracy in that area. We have the, uh, how, uh, how the, from the viewpoint of the radar operator that, flight di that shot down uh, the commercial flight uh, 752, that's another sub story and uh, what Putin must be going through discussing with his hawkish uh, generals right now is saying I'm ready and his dumbish economic advisors who are saying it's going to bring down the Soviet Union. So um, it's all there and um, I, when that picture was up uh, earlier I could sort of map the characters uh, to all of the uh, uh, people that were that are in today's thing, but I could also map the characters to Hamlet's uh, uh, story too. So it's um, but the, the point uh, out of that is that's why Dostoevsky uh, uh, is still on. Now adding one more point, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky. I'm not pronouncing it right. I should know better. Dostoevsky. Fyodor. You're good. You're good. 
<laughs> no, okay. Uh, was not really Russian. He was Ukrainian. And he was not really Ukrainian. He was Polish. Um, and uh, all, uh, so uh, uh, it, 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 uh, I think 500 years from now, people will still be discussing this uh, same story. And they may look at your, your videos to uh, get the material. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Joe, up next. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Peter's that complex of a character. I mean, I agree totally with Doug uh, in the sense that, yes, maybe he's able to manipulate people, uh, you know, people of influence, people of power, like, you know, the governor's wife and governor, and, and he's able to kind of manipulate uh, the five as well, or four. Um, but uh, I think ultimately, you know, that essentially he's just Dostoevsky telling us this is what nihilism is um and this is what uh a kind of um an approach where essentially he's just he he's not for anything he's not even for socialism he acts like he's for the the working man but he's not he's actually just own, out for his own gratification mm -hmm. and he's out for his own political interests like he, he I, I don't know what he sees himself as after this fall but at the same time i just see him as this uh as this kind of and this is the problem with you know i guess that dostoevsky is criticizing with modernity is that what is the vision like what is the end goal and and i and i think that he's um uh i you know i i just think he's just somebody that wants to as doug said wants to see the world burn period and i just don't think a joker like it's character. it's a i didn't want to bring that character up but that's exactly what it is i mean that's you know there's no reason behind it when he this this idea that it, it, you know he'd burn the money behind him if he could right. like that essentially that money doesn't matter things don't matter mm -hmm. i just you know i'm Human just lives uh, don't matter it's it's exactly it it's everything is uh, 100 you know, million 200 million i mean or one person it, what does it matter it, it, it's it, it's all the same to him they're right. just things right. um and i thought actually that is a perfect example i didn't want to bring up the batman example but 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 it's but it is it's one of the greatest examples of in modern film history uh, in the past 20 years of i think with uh, this idea of chaos Mm -hmm. where you know there's absolutely he, he wants no moral order at all to the universe that his he's like the you know he's like the antichrist mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean well the, and, that's and, that's a great uh, way to portray him because we're it's a religious novel in a way that's what i'm saying in, in yeah. a sense that's what he that's essentially what he is um, let me throw so, one monkey wrench into that how about uh, the idea of organized chaos um it, it, I guess it is organized chaos to a certain degree. I mean, in, in a way, the, I, otherwise it wouldn't be, he wouldn't be because successful. Because he's the one organizing it, right? Yeah, he's the exactly, one exactly. I mean, so there, there, it, it is, I mean, he, he wouldn't, if he were in, if he were unsuccessful, then, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be organized. But if he were just, although, uh, no, yeah, yeah, you're you're right. It's organized, but it does it's effective nonetheless. Let, let's step back. Uh, thank, thanks, Joe. I I just want to step back for two seconds. Um, let's think back about what happened in the very beginning, and and maybe draw a line to where we are now in the book. Uh, in the very beginning, we're told that Varvara Petrovna and um, uh, Stepan Trofimovich, the two older old guards right the representation of the older generation the older values but ones that are open to progressivism and open to new ideas they're hosting these evenings with the promising young men in town and who are these promising young men well it's people like Lamshin and uh, uh, Shigalev and uh, some of the ones that are now part of that five right um we're also told that Stepan Trofimovich is the tutor, uh, teacher figure for pretty much everybody in this novel. He taught uh, Nikolai Stavrogin. He taught everybody except his son, <laughs> pretty much. He taught Lisa. 
he taught, so they are all products in a sense of, of these teachers. And I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking. It's almost like, um, you know, these college professors today on, on in university campuses, they're in their like, you know, they're boomers, right? <laughs> um, they've taught this generation of people who are now throwing rocks at them and burning buildings and saying, uh, we need to uproot this whole system that we were part of. And we got the benefit of the education from that, but now we, we've seen the light. Thank you very much, by the way, for showing us the light. Uh, and we're going to hang you now on, on I mean, we, we haven't, we're not there yet. And I'm not saying we will be there, but to Dostoevsky, when he was looking at it, when he was looking at these revolutionary organizations sprouting up in Europe and in Russia, and he was part of one himself, um, he, drew, he drew a parallel and said, look, uh, they're just like one step away from violence. Uh, and when he found out about the murder of that student, when he read in the G when he was in Geneva and read in the newspaper about the murder of the student who was part of a secret society, that was the final trigger to him. He said, it, "It's not just a guess; it's actually already happening." And it may, I, I want to remind you that uh, a year after Dostoevsky died, or maybe it was the same year—I think it was the same year when he died—Alexander II, the Tsar of Russia, was assassinated. Uh, he was assassinated after 20 plus attempts on his life. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, they, uh, in Russia, they are very slow to, to respond to things. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, he had 20, 20 plus attempts and finally they succeeded and they blew him up. They, somebody threw a bomb, exploded in his uh, chariot uh, and uh, killed him. Um, and of course, uh, that was again, uh, like Madeline mentioned, these were just the flowers. Uh, and the full um, harvest is, it was coming still. And uh, that came a little bit later. Uh, and then, you know, the trickles of blood became rivers of blood. Uh, but how did it start? Well, it started to Dostoevsky anyway, with, with this education and with, with some of the ideas, the memes as Doug would say, uh, that were planted. And some of these memes were about nihilism. Some of them were about uh, the, um, uh, materialism versus spiritual things and materialism versus beauty. If you remember one of the discussions that keeps coming up, what is more important, a physical apple or a wonderful painting of an apple? And this is not, you know, it's come up already several times, it'll come up again. And this idea of Sistine uh, Madonna, you know, should we be just be talking about it or, or is really like feeding the poor more important than Sistine Madonna? I mean, that's an open question. And I don't know how you answer it. Uh, people ha have different answers for it. What's more important, the eternal or the immediate, the fundamental material basis, as Marx would say, uh, or the uh, the edifice that that is built on top of that material base, and material relations. Uh, the, these are these are all um, questions in the novel. I, I just again, I'm, I'm I, I know I'm framing some of this uh, discussion, but I, I just want to point out some of the important questions that. You know, to, just to make sure we don't pass them over because they are they are kind of critical in in, in the scheme of things. Uh, we have uh, Maritza and Joe. Um, you you brought up the concept of organized um, house, and I would say it's almost more like orchestrated house in that he's he's the like it seems like almost all of the characters are kind of just haphazardly flopping about, but, you know, Piotr has this very sharp, precise plan of action. We don't quite know it yet, but he's got an entire orchestra that he's setting up. Oh, for so, sure. um, for sure. you know, he's definitely, he's building this house, but it's, um, it's, it's with this like severe intent and it shines a spotlight how, how, on how, everyone else is just kind of extremely uncertain and unsure of what path they should be following. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, it's an interesting juxtaposition there of um, characters. Um, and, you know, since you brought up the, um, you know, Varada's uh, speech to um, uh, Stefan um, in their breakup scene, it, it's, I, I was, you know, I, I wrote that, question down and I didn't actually have an answer when I read that and I, I, I meant to go back and reread it and I, I didn't get the chance um, but I'm going to ponder it here in real time with all of you 
this question of, you know, which is more important? And no, it makes my brain hurt. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I feel like it's impossible to, it's not an either or question, or it shouldn't be. And maybe to me, it seems almost sacrilegious to have to be expected to. Ah, we're back to choose. sacred and profane. Right. <laughs> how, could, how could one possibly live without both? I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's what comes to mind for me. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think that we can, I mean, I'm sure that's possible, but I don't believe that we should aspire to a world where we truly would pick one or the other. Um, so I don't well, know. It goes, I, I, I'm, to, it goes back to the old Marxist maxim. Uh, whether you believe it or not will determine how you answer that question. Being determines consciousness. If you believe that, then you have the answer. But if consciousness determines being, then... <laughs> mm. I'm going to get back to you on that one. Okay, okay. Uh, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> I think that you raise a really interesting point, but this, uh, especially the example of the Sistine Madonna was a, was, you know, was a very important point. Um, uh, and, and it was kind of, that's where you kind of saw Vervana's, uh, basically her reaction um, to, to uh, Stefan about that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and essentially that the thing that's, that's, that's most, I, I think that this idea of uh, materialism is really kind of the, one of the most important things about when you're talking about especially we were talking about Peter. Um, it's everything is the material that essentially you can throw out everything that was sacred prior to what is existing today. I'm only looking at what is right in front of me now, what mm -hmm. the workers rights are, what's everything, everything else that existed prior to this. And there's a yes, no answer to all the problems in the world that I can create this utopia that exists and I can orchestrate, as Marit said, et cetera, you know, organized chaos. It's, it's essentially um, a, I, I can organize a, a utopia or a better world. Now, is that what he's actually, I don't, I don't even know what he's actually really thinking, but, um, but I, I, I think that this is, this is kind of the main question is this idea of materialism, what really matters in this world? Is there something bigger than ourselves or is it just goods and services? Is that well, what we're reducing the world to? And I think that that's fundamental to the entire, like kind of to, to the entire book. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of those big questions as to modernity itself. Absolutely. And then if you also, and if you're also talking about this, this is kind of where, you know, this is where you do see some of the Nietzsche warnings like where art is the highest, you know, where art and literature and thinking along those lines, the importance of those things, like he warned against this adherence to science and yes, no answers that, right. that essentially that would be, that essentially would be, I have a solution to all your problems. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I, I think that that's the, that's when you're getting to, that's what Peter's all about is it, he sees the world as a, Primarily materialist. Pater yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's what exactly Dostoevsky is really. And yet, and yet, uh, the title of the novel is, is Bese, The Demons, which is obviously not something you would expect a materialist to be. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, yeah, it should be the opposite. <laughs> it should be the opposite, right. Uh, I want to quickly uh, share my screen. Um, what I have on my screen is um, uh, this excerpt from the file I posted, which is the Chernyshevsky's work, A Vital Question. And there you have this second dream of Vera Pavlovna, not Vera Nikolaevna, as, Vera, as I said earlier, Vera Pavlovna. Um, and this dream is an excellent commentary on what we were talking about. These two men, they're walking in the field and they are discussing the nature of two kinds of dirt, a healthy dirt and an unhealthy dirt. And the types of dirt <laughs> that is healthy is the one that is active and in motion. And what is the, uh, the kind of active or the kind of healthy activity that you have? Well, it's labor, right? 
And then you have the, and that, and that kind of dirt produces a healthy wheat of, uh, grain of wheat. But the unhealthy uh, uh, dirt is the kind you find in a swamp when there is no activity, meaning there is no labor. Kind of like, you know, maybe a bourgeois sitting in a lounge chair, or maybe what we're doing right now, not working, but kind of just sitting back and enjoying ourselves and doing nothing. Um, but anyway, this kind of dirt is what he calls a uh, fantastical, <laughs> fantastical dirt, and that produces unhealthy things. So this is Chernyshevsky. Uh, in, in some ways, again, these dreams, they are not being funny. They're actually taking truths from French uh, materialists who are uh, Dostoevsky mentions in passing, and Chernyshevsky is one of them, and they talk about uh, the supremacy of material over um, I idealistic things, you know, the arts. Uh, and then Ch and Chernyshevsky, by the way, wrote a whole dissertation on uh, the relationship between the two. So this question of apple versus uh, a drawing is not fully uh, fantastical. It's actually taken from a, a real life uh, dissertation by Chernyshevsky, who in fact gives us an answer. And in, in his mind, reality is more beautiful than any artwork. That's what's more beautiful is reality, like material reality. And uh, of course, Dostoevsky picks up on this and he puts it in um, as, as one of the discussions in, in, in the book. Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop there. This is, by the way, coming from that file I shared earlier in the chat. So if you, if you wanna go back in chat history and download it and you, you can read this later uh, on your own uh, if you're interested. It, it, the, the, these dreams, they're wonderful. Uh, they're, they're, they're really good. I re highly recommend the dreams. Uh, even if you don't read the entire thing, <laughs> just pick out the dreams and then read them. You're highly entertaining. Um, um, anyway, uh, let's see who, uh, Jeannie, go ahead. And then Allison. Or Allison, was that, no, uh, you have something? Or, um, yeah. I think Maritza had her hand up. Oh, too. okay. So uh, Jeannie, uh, Maritza, and then Allison. It could also refer to political action versus political talk. So in the first part of the novel, there was talk, 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 but it, you know, people got impatient, nothing was happening. Now you have a chance for political action. So something is going to happen, but the problem is you can be very purposeful, but you don't know what the outcome will be. However, if you take no action at all, well, you can pretty much guess what the outcome of that will be. So it's, I think this, you know, the good dirt being you take a political action, but it's got to be the right thing to make something actually grow after that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought of it that, in that way. Uh, Maritz and then Allison. Oh, man. Jeannie's statement was so intriguing that it took my other comment out of my head. Um, <laughs> uh I was going to make a comment or something Joe had you said. You want Allison to go first while you're... Yes. Uh, okay, Allison, go ahead. We'll come back to where it's at that for you. Um, I feel like we're going back and forth trying to figure out Dostoevsky's political beliefs about this. But from what I have seen from his other books is that it's not so much about the politics. His real you know, thing is that he's very, very religious and he's very moral. And so that's really the center and the politics aren't really the point. Um, but the other thing, I, a couple of things I want to say, the other one I want to say, what you guys, you and Joe are both saying about the Joker being a nihilist, that's just bland. I've never understood why the Joker was there. I just thought he was like, uh, you know, like in Shakespeare, where like the, you know. A prop. Yeah. But what I, one thing I have found in the last year of doing this is that I keep looking at things in popular culture and seeing stuff in there that I never saw. Like, um, what was it? I was watching Frosty the Snowman and I was like, oh my God, it's reincarnation. Oh, like, <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm seeing all these things from all these books we're reading with this group and, and I just see it in popular culture. I'm like, that's where they got that. That's where they got that. So uh, yeah, it's fun. Uh, Maritza, did you? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Elson. Uh, did you remember your, <laughs> your original point? Nope, that comment's gone forever. <laughs> but um, I will. No, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a little more time. Uh, I did want to bring up uh, one other one other thing that I thought was interesting, and that maybe uh, you you guys can can comment on, and this idea of 
uh, the conversation between the famous writer, <laughs> who of course is uh, the, the set, the parody of Turgenev, the famous writer and Pyotr uh, Stepanovich. And uh, the, the famous writer, uh, uh, Karmazinov, I always forget, uh, Karmazinov, yeah. Uh, so he is an interesting figure. Uh, first, I, I, I don't know if you love the, the description of him. He always likes to kiss you, but he doesn't actually want to kiss you. He wants to just you to kiss him. So he always <laughs> puts out his cheek <laughs> so you can kiss him. I thought that was just a, what a great observation. You have all these people at these, uh, I'm thinking of like New York elite soirees, you know, all these ladies that are doing charity or whatever. And they're all like, hi, <laughs> and they, they, they put up their cheek. Like they think they are important. So you should be kissing them, <laughs> but they're not actually interested in, uh, uh, affection it's more of a formal thing but you know Dostoevsky makes makes fun of it uh but the other thing of course is this uh uh pandering that we see from people who are representative of the intelligentsia of the day pandering to these young nobodies i mean Pyotr stepanovich is a nobody yes he has uh this um uh sort of uh uh what's the word like a um He's surrounded by mystery, and he has the—he uh, is this man of mystery, international mystery. In fact, he's supposed to be tied to um, international uh, revolutionaries and the international in general, you know, the Workers League and so forth. Uh, but in fact, he has done nothing, and yet you have this man who is an actual writer, and he is uh, pandering to him. So that's an interesting conversation about how the older generation is responding and, and uh, acting and reacting to this newer generation, which is actually desiring to uproot them completely. And what, what the proper relation should be. Is there a proper relation? Is there a way to these groups to coexist somehow? Uh, but the other thing is, in their conversation, uh, what's mentioned is this idea that if you call men to a society where everybody is free to be dishonorable, they might actually follow that. There's something attractive about a society where there is no, where the concept of honor is gone. And you know, when, when, I, when I read that, I, I was thinking before that, what would be one word where I could, how I can describe Pyotr Stepanovich? And now I know it, the word is dishonorable because <laughs> he's a man who, who despises that. He despises honor as a concept and he acts like that too. He acts in a dishonorable way. He makes secrets known, uh, things that are spoken in confidence. He makes it known to, to people uh, in broad daylight, and he collides people on purpose. He's a dishonorable man. But his appeal is, is that exactly. The appeal is that the concept of honor is outdated, outmoded, and, in, and we need to create a society where we bury this concept. This concept comes from us from, from aristocracy. That's, that's where the concept of honor comes from, aristocracy, the idea of uh, sacred, right? That's honor is very much related to that. So I, I have a question again, uh, maybe another framing for the discussion. We have only maybe a few minutes left. It's already seven o'clock. Uh, what do you guys think about this idea of dishonor as a as a rallying cry, as a as a way to unify people? Um, is that is it really something that might appeal to a, a, some segment of population? Uh, does anybody want to take that or any other thoughts? Uh, Madeline, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, I'm glad you brought up Karamazinov. Um, you know, we, we'd heard about him. We'd heard about him in relation to Stepan Trevinovich. And it seems as if um, he's sort of the one whose presence and his snubbing of Stepan um, sort of show us in, in another, from another angle, uh, that Stepan is not going to be the great artist or a genius of some sort that he had hoped to be. At the same time, he's not such a great guy. Um, he does that thing where he drops his purse and is waiting to see if the, uh, if the other person picks it up. And that's a, that's a sort of a strange little it's a very calculated power move that I think very few people would think to do. Um, and 
also that uh, Pyotr Stepanovich does respect him enough to give him a timeline for when he thinks the revolution will be taking place. Even though he thinks he is a rat leaving a sinking ship, mm -hmm. um, he still, at least there's someone who he respects enough, unless, it's, unless this is just part of his general uh, devilry uh, and he's got something up his sleeve. Actually, another question, which was during the conspirators meeting and I think elsewhere, Mm -hmm. um, there are these groups of five, but then there are people, um, a couple of times it's mentioned that it's, uh, the whole thing is run by three and a half men. And I don't know um, if that was like a Russian saying, you know, it's like three and a half men and a bottle of vodka can run the world or... Um, <laughs> Sounds it, like a pirate song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> or no, if, I don't, they, I don't, I, if they really meant like, you know, it's just us. If no one else does it, it's just those of us who are right. sitting no, here who are going to do it. Yeah, he wanted to, uh, the, the, that reference is not meant to be literal. It's of course, uh, just to underline how few people are involved and how, how like a minuscule that organization really is, uh, despite the appearance of that it's some sort of international, uh, you know, uh, web of conspirators around the world. I mean, keep in mind, and this is actually amazing, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, were a minority party. They call themselves Bolsheviks, which of course means the, the majors, but they were not by any stretch of, of, of imagination the majors. They were a minority, but they were extremely hardliners, devoted uh, to the point of death. And the rules were similar to, you know, that, that student that got killed. If somebody were to leave, and uh, if there was a chance that he would tell on them, uh, they would go as far as kill him. There's no question about that. So to them, there was no line which was too far for, in other words, the, the means uh, definitely justified the ends. And we know how, how well that typically ends. And so they, they've taken that policy all the way to Stalin who then just let it rip. Um, but from the very beginning, uh, you had this idea that well, you, you really need a, uh, an, an enormous organization to, to make a change. You really don't. You just need very few people who make the appearance that they control everything and have power, and then people fall in line like crazy. And that's what you know, Dostoevsky is underlying, that how very few uh, people in that group could, could actually create this, wreak havoc on this entire uh, town, even though it's not that big, but still it's a microcosm and the reflection of the country in general. So, uh, Doug, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, uh, in the honor, the thing about honor, I think, and why it's so controversial is that it's often used as an excuse for extreme violence and the manipulation of other people, especially women. Uh, my honor is at stake and, and people do ridiculous things. Uh, I think if you read Gandhi's autobiography and his sense of what making a vow means and what it means to follow through a vow, even when his wife begs him to take it back, like she was sick and couldn't eat milk, so he vowed he would not drink milk the rest of his life because she couldn't, and she begged him to take that back, and he never did. He lived by that vow, you know, and because he felt living according to a vow, almost like a medieval knight, led to a certain kind of virtue or virtue or, but see, that's not how honor is often practiced. And in Shakespeare, people make vows, and within a page, they're forced into a situation where they have to break the vow. I mean, Shakespeare is a dance of vows made and broken. And sometimes they do it on the next page. Sometimes they do it at the end of the play. But the vows are often made. And some of them are kept. But the, And those are some of the better characters in Shakespeare. But most of them don't even remember they made the vow. And so uh, honor is a really fascinating thing in Shakespeare and how, how it's used and abused, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to keep coming back to, and uh, Joe, I'll give you a, uh, a chance to say something in a second. I, uh, I take your point about that, the, that honor is indeed a controversial subject, and it, and it is absolutely uh, misused um, a lot of times. But I want to make the connection uh, to, to this idea that the source of that, the source of even this concept making any sense whatsoever 
is not materialistic. It cannot be. It's not a rational source for, for as far as we, we can tell. Because you can say something, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, diet, right? So I'm not going to eat whatever. And then you break that. Well, it's no big deal. I mean, you can always go back to it the next day. It's not like uh, uh, some angel in heaven is offended because you, you, you know, keep your diet 100% or whatever it is. Uh, however, if you say, if you give your word, right? I mean, and people don't even use this anymore. Like, what is that even like? I'll give you my word of honor, right? Or uh, um, that is a completely different thing. It's a reputation thing, right? But it's also the they, they, the reason why that was that made any kind of sense was because no. there was something attached to it. That, there was some concept that was uh, be, beyond just you or me. Sorry. I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll give you a chance in a second um, if you could raise your hand. Um, and so uh, this idea of honor really goes back to the. the yes. By all means, you know what to find her. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, this idea of honor goes back to uh, this idea of, of the divine. And this, uh, remember that story about the captain who said, if there is no God, what kind of captain am I? What did he mean by that? Well, he meant was that, of course, you can assign um, a title of captain to anybody, and we do that still in military. And so, like, you, you have to pass some sort of religious test to be a captain. However, the um, respect that comes with that title <clears throat> is arbitrary. And the, uh, the respect that typically is given to that, or to military, or to any kind of title in general, comes from a sort of this idea that there is a uh, hierarchy of values that goes all the way up to something that is beyond us. And when uh, we see various in intrusions into that territory and challenges of that um, philosophy in general, uh, that's when Dostoevsky makes, you know, he makes an argument that that's the beginning of trouble. That everything else, including violence and terrible violence, follows that initial step where you part company with uh, divine honor, and then everything else goes as a as a as a stream from there, uh, as a, as a torrent. You just open the floodgates, and then everything else just 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 goes downhill. So that's that's his claim. And I'm not saying it's true or not true. I'm just saying that's that seems to be his his uh, his philosophy. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, honor is an interesting thing, and you know we've had discussions actually at 52 Living Ideas about that specifically. Um, I mean, there's a saying too that uh, Cicero has that uh, honor is for, it's not for, you know, paraphrasing, but it's not for profit, but rather for the merit itself. And so that you're actually for something that is beyond yourself. And I think this is actually an interesting contrast when you're talking about materialism being the alternative, because what are you then dying for? Are you dying for goods and services versus the idea of something itself. Now, to Doug's point, it can be uh, it, it, it can be used as uh, it can be weaponized, I, I shall say, um, in the name of, uh, of uh, religion, where you think that, you know, you're going to sacrifice yourself and that you're doing it for a reward. But if you're doing it just for merit, the basis of something, that you truly believe in that's something that's different and that's the plus side of honor mm -hmm. so i mean and, and i and i it's and it's and it's something that that if you reduce everything to material you know material goods and and based on needs of production and we can't forget the fact that this is the industrial age we're talking about mm -hmm. um that then at that particular moment in time, then that value system, they're really, you're kind of robbing yourself of the honor of any kind of true honor that you're not, that you're doing something for the, for the ideal, so to speak. Um, which, so introducing that actual idea into this, into this, um, into this discussion is interesting because it's just, it shows you that 
what it means to not have it. It's it's as much as you know as bad as it can be used. Yes, it can be used as something to to uh, encourage people to lay down their lives for a meaningless cause, but it also gives there's something else. There's a flip side to it. I mean, if you think about Peter. He's he is the most dishonorable individual that you right. probably will have ever come across. Mm -hmm. He he lies, he cheats, uh, or, or cheats, or, but you know he 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 essentially is manipulative. He has no moral compass at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this lack of honor is is something that needs to be you know kind of examined because we it gets a bad rap sometimes when we look at at, at how honor is kind of uh looked at in mainstream sometimes i i also think and that yet, there's and yet uh the claim is made that again a society that is without honor has uh has some appeal right right and i mean no there's 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 a lot of uh, people the people that feel that way i mean but there's also this element too that there's an idea of self in this as well you know when you have honor and self-respect Mm -hmm. um so that that you know th that if you're holding yourself to some ideal you're attaching to yourself to something that you know that's honorable quote unquote yeah. it's an interesting it's it's just an interesting uh way of looking at um at this particular moment in time, especially when you're talking about during the industrial age you right. know what is really you know that during this period of time right. anyway. well I'll, i also want to i want to throw another uh perspective here which is a, a Nietzsche and mm -hmm. this idea that well you know gods are dead god is dead um so right. wh what do we have now right. well what we have is a will to life right a person who is strongest who has the strongest will to life he is the noble man and he tramples everybody underfoot like those you know vikings and nibelungs and so forth riding to Valhalla, <laughs> right. you know, and we know where, again, we know, we know how, how that ends up, how that story can end up. Um, yeah, so Dostoevsky, I mean, he foreshadows so many of these uh, 20th century phenomena that are really embodiments of these ideas. So we think of them as fantastical now because they've already been tried and somewhat disproven, but back then they were not disproven and people really thought that to, not, uh, technology was going to solve our problem our problems um that uh a lack of religion you know religion was this opium of the people and as soon as we get rid of the opium man we're going to be great <laughs> and now uh, what, what's ironic to me is in the, uh, the uh, the late 20th century we have the opioid um uh, epidemic people are actually taking real drugs <laughs> they don't have the religious drug but they're taking physical drugs <laughs> and we have a war on that so it's it's almost ironic how, how that has played out, right? Uh, yeah, Madeline is laughing. <laughs> uh, Madeline, go ahead, uh, you wanted to say something. And then Allison. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Phil. Uh, opiates are the religion of the people. <laughs> That's great. Um, I was wondering if we could talk about uh, all of these military men, because we had mm -hmm. a few things about it in chat, mm -hmm. in terms of honor. Um, so they were just uh, staggering out of the Crimean War which was a big cluster, uh, mm -hmm. this will be on YouTube. So I'll, I'll call it a cluster cluck. Cluster cluck, okay. It was a big cluster cluck. Sure. Um, <laughs> lots of different countries involved. It was a proxy war for different religions. There was a lot going on mm -hmm. and everyone did terribly. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one, no but one- Russia did good. worse than most by all accounts, probably. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't that where uh, the charge of the light brigade took place. Uh, um well regardless though they they lost a lot of influence and men and they didn't win anything and it was kind of an impasse in one sense but then they lost a lot of resources on this so they didn't win anything uh, okay so um so they're coming out of the crimean war russia did bet, did worse than everyone else let's say um and we have all these military types and we even had Gurganov, Gurganov the younger whose father had been led around by the nose yep mm -hmm. who's so intent on the duel that it doesn't matter um, if Nikolai Stavrogin, in his vast contempt and indifference, agrees to apologize mm -hmm. however many times because he actually doesn't care. Mm -hmm. um, so he doesn't care if he apologizes or not. Um, so he 
but um, so Gurganov the Younger feels that the dishonor to his father has carried over to him and he has somehow sort of had been staining his regiment by his presence there mm -hmm. just with the fact of the family dishonor mm -hmm. so it's almost like um like a contamination transfer in a way from one generation to another and then from one person to a group um of this initial humiliation and then there are these others um the point uh, earlier in this section where uh, Nikolai Stavrogin has finished the duel and now everyone's talking about him and he's being admired, but that is generated by an old general mm -hmm. who is the one who takes up the topic yep. and kind of gives his seal of approval to the whole thing. Um, and so it would be kind of as if... Um, like maybe these were people in the 1950s or 1960s who still had all those Second World War veterans around. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe even the 1980s, they were getting old, but they were still there and they were still kind of a reminder of um, the enormous sacrifices that people will make uh, for a cause and for honor. And for their country. And for their country. And then along the lines of um, what Joe was saying about honor, um, Joe had led a terrific meetup group called Is It Ever Right to Lie? <laughs> and it was really fascinating. I actually went uh, twice. And- um, Are you lying? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it actually, um, we, we actually basically all ended up agreeing that even, um, even a very small white lie is not a good thing because basically lies uh, disrupt the fabric of society. They create so much mistrust um, that, although, I mean, they go way back, we can see other animals in the, other an in the animal kingdom tricking each other. So it's not this human invention. Um, but nonetheless, um, so the level of lying that goes on in this book is also very interesting who's lying and who isn't mm -hmm. and who are they lying to and what is it about? Right, well, it's very interesting to me that when you were talking about this just now, you brought up uh, other animals that are tricking each other. See, if you go- I, 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 I have to ask, what animals trick each other? Please tell me. Oh, probably primates, I'm guessing, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Primates, elephants, um, parrots. Elephants? Sure. Any. Oh. Um, Basically, any of the more enculturated animals, um, you might see dogs playing tricks on their owners sometimes, oh. or cats might play tricks on their owners. And they, they do it with a sense of humor. Um, otters will do it. Um, yeah. But, but going back to that, uh, see what you're doing is uh, appealing to a materialistic argument, right? So this is evolutionary plausible that you know lying is actually an adaptation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which is completely orthogonal to this idea that in fact lying is bad, not because it's a uh, or good, not because it's an adaptation, but because it's comes from us from above, from Ten Commandments or whatever. Uh, see, that's a two different arguments, right? You can argue from an evolutionary standpoint, which is what we hear today about this or that. And and by the way, uh, those arguments uh, are not solvable because they are predicated on specific things, right? They're not some Kantian universal truth that's binding. Uh, just because it was biologically ad um, uh, advantageous to, to be this way in one circumstance doesn't mean it's always true, et cetera. You can never derive universal truths from inductive reasoning, right? Ever. <laughs> However, uh, if you have this absolute source of truth, which unfortunately we don't, uh, you could say, well, uh, we have this revelation from God that, that lying is bad, end of story. <laughs> And that's how most of society functioned until the very, uh, I mean, for like 900 years, for 2000 years, I would say, from, you know, Christianity onwards, right, from the birth of Christianity onwards. And at the end of 19th century, all of that was pretty much dismantled. And now we're, like I said, we're playing this great experiment to see if indeed we can survive based on uh, the materialistic argument of, well, this is an adaptation and th that is an adaptation and uh, you know, you could you could do this or that or whatever, um, <laughs> and maybe it's a societal consensus issue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
it's I think the the jury is still out uh, as far as I'm concerned whether it, we, we're going to end up in a stable uh, society or not. Um, there, there's there's arguments I think on both sides, but the Stasky definitely addresses that and raises that point that uh, there's a materialistic argument and there is a uh, spiritual argument, and uh, the battle of the two is partly the battle of this book, right? The battle of sacred and profane. Are those just conventions? Or, or can society actually, or can the society actually need something that's considered sacred to function? Uh, and where, 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 where's, the, uh, where's the authority for determining what is sacred? Where does that come from? Because otherwise it can't be really sacred, right? If I just determine it by decree that it's sacred, then it doesn't work. Maybe it's some kind of um, societal, um, change that happens and most people believe something is sacred. By the way, in, in this country, uh, freedom used to be sacred. Um, and anybody who would say something against liberty and freedom well, would be maligned. But now I think different ideals are coming to, for, to the forefront and maybe equality or justice, social justice is the, is the sacred thing. And you dare not speak against that. And, and maybe a hundred years later, it'll be something else. And you see how, how since these things are sort of... Um, evolving, it's hard to say, are they going to last 30 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, right? Whereas uh, if you have something that is uh, sort of immutable in a sense, then you can just uh, build on that. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, just really quickly, I mean, it, this idea of sacred is, if you take the Durkheim perspective, it's like, from what I remembered, it, it, and my, correct me if I'm wrong about this, is that it's just anything that's outside the norm that you're considering like that's transcends to a higher ideal so it doesn't necessarily have to be like as you mentioned it can be for something for like a belief system of a country or something along those lines that you know it's it's not necessarily godlike correct and, and I, I, uh, if we're talking about Durkheim I think his point was that it's almost arbitrary uh right opinion the point is that it's these uh, points of, of what's sacred and profane is they allow society to function. Because right. They allow points of agreement and consensus. People can rally and agree around these things and, and pretty much they can agree on anything and they can function about, they, it makes them function in a lot of different ways. Once they have these, they have determined these points and then they can like build everything else from there. Uh, and, 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 and as a matter of fact, these, like I said, the, these points themselves are almost arbitrary, almost, not quite. But almost arbitrary uh, in, right. in, a, in a more primitive in a more primitive uh, religions like he talks about the Australian bushmen and the things that they were doing they're kind of arbitrary but then in a more more advanced religions what's interesting is you have these points of sacredness they uh, they coincide with points of morality which are you can then argue those are actual social adaptations right uh, uh, and then that's what where, where it becomes really interesting uh, but it, it's almost like it, it's a thing of scale to a certain degree too yeah yeah i mean you know the, it's communal to a point but as these religions grow i mean it becomes a thing of scale so it, it, i mean it was interesting because it was a, a conversation about just war theory like you know people had to yeah. justify war and defense at some point and sacredness you know the idea of of, of because uh it was about a duty mm -hmm. of defending whatever because society had become so dependent on these religious anyway it's a whole thing to it there's a whole story behind right. it. i'm not gonna go off of that all right we're we're almost ready to uh wrap up for tonight i just want to mention one thing uh so for the reading next time we're going to finish up uh part two and and the reading that that is in your appendix and the, the one that i shared last time with that chapter that was censored out that comes right after uh uh, chapter eight, which we, uh, so we, we read up to chapter seven and it's gonna be right after chapter eight comes the chapter where Nikolai Stavrogin goes to the, to Tikhon, uh, the, um, um, what's it, uh, what, what, I'm trying to think, church father, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, uh, the clergyman, uh, Trying to think of monk, the monk <laughs> escaping me. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you want to read that, uh, go ahead and read that uh, as part of the reading for next time.
Um, we have a couple um, of minutes. If anybody has closing thoughts you want to share, go sure. ahead. Otherwise, uh, we can part. Um, so it's just it's, to just to clarify. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to read chapter seven, Bishop Tikhon, and then chapters eight, nine, and ten. We read seven this time, so it's going to be eight. After that, you can read the extra chapter, the one that's typically in your appendix. Um, and then after that, you read the, the remaining chapters in that uh, in that section, uh, part two. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's not in the constant. That's not in the constant scare version, is it? No, yeah. no, it's yeah. not. But I, I, I last time I, I shared, I can I can share the book again that has that has it in the uh, appendix, I believe. Can you yeah, can you yeah. Yeah, and can you add that to the event description? I can do that as well. Thank you. That way, people who aren't here today have a chance of noticing. Yes, I can do that. Give me just a second. My so, so while you're writing that up, we're going to finish part two, which is the la which is four chapters including this originally uh censored chapter that some translations include as chapter nine and others include as an appendix and it, it if you're reading it as an appendix and want to read it in the quote unquote intended order you would read chapter eight then the appendix at T. Combs, uh, followed by the last two chapters. Uh, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed what you just said because I'm still trying to share the stuff. Uh, no, it's just four chapters. It should, yes, it should be four chapters if you include the, the extra reading. We have chapter nine is their appendix. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad we're doing it like this. Um, I, as I'd mentioned in a previous meetup, I had uh, read, I suppose you'd call it, or listened to the whole thing as an audio book one time through um, while I'm out walking. And now I'm listening to it just in sections in preparation for the discussions. And in the audio book version that I have, which I think is the gardener, they, um, they added the Tikhon chapter as an appendix at the end. And it wasn't so much that it completely changed the book for me because I, I had some idea anyway, but it was that um, with that, it wasn't what Dostoevsky intended as the ending. You know, it wasn't his ending to the book. His ending to the book was his ending to the book. He wasn't intending a, to have this whole other thing go on at the end that was supposed to be approximately right here, which is about halfway through. So um, I think it's really great that we are going to be reading it in order because yeah. I, you know, unless we're doing a meetup on the effect of censorship on books, we, you know, <laughs> well, we should, that could be a should, separate, uh, separate yeah. conversation. Yeah. But we should be reading it the way the author intended it. Absolutely. To be, so I'm glad we're doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, in some sense, the author intended it to be omitted because he agreed with the censors and published it without that chapter. <laughs> well, <laughs> when uh, wait agreed, until you he read didn't it. Really have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't really have a choice. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was great. A great discussion. Um,